Thank you all. That's very, very kind. Yes, my family is certainly the, uh, the, the, the scene behind the scene. Well, I'm really excited to be sharing with you one thing, one thing that matters so very much to me. Uh, as we go through these unique messages, uh, you know, you're going to find out a little bit of just what the Lord has been doing and been up to in us. And we mean this as an encouragement. We, we don't mean to put ourselves on display as much as we just have this great opportunity to sit at the table together and to say, here's a glimpse into, uh, into my heart, into my spiritual life, and I hope that it's an encouragement uh, for you as well. I should also note, I'm very excited for Caleb to share. Uh, Caleb leads us so faithfully, and on August 18th, he's going to share a message uh, from his heart, his one thing, um, and I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to that. I won't spoil it, but I know it's going to be a formative week. Um, each of these messages, as it comes from the heart, it's like this, our own letter, our own open letter to this church about what we find most important to pass on. So I, I hope, again, that you hear this as a conversation that's for you today. And today, what I want to relay is what I've been learning personally and pastorally uh, for quite some time now about spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is my one thing. I want to ask the question, can Jesus really change your life and mine? In, uh, in 2013, 11 years ago, I was a student ministries pastor at a different church, and we had a vacation Bible school uh, for children that year, and I was excited in particular on that year because for the first time since I started as a student minister, I was going to have students who had just graduated working with me as part of the team, and I was so excited for that. Um, in fact, there was a young man there who I still consider a friend today who was my direct helper. He and I were working together, and we were helping incoming sixth grade students get a sense for the youth ministry and the leaders. And I love this guy, and I loved his story uh, because he had gotten saved just a year and a half before. I was giddy, and he was beaming. He was so excited to be part of this too. By day two of VBS, I don't know if you've ever done VBS, but day one's a lot of fun. By day two, you're already starting to feel the tiredness. And by day two, I caught my friend horsing around when it was time to move the group on to a different room. And so, I planted my feet. I made sure to suck it in a little bit, you know, try to look a little taller. <clears throat> Let's go. I got real short with my friend. And after the children left for the night, we went through the rest of the night and everything seemed fine. But at the end of the night, after the kids had gone, my friend came to me. I was sitting and he walked up and very brightly he said, hey, can we talk? And uh, he wanted to ask about that moment, about the moment where I became impatient with him for just having fun. He said, uh, I remember this, he, he, he asked, what, whatever he said before, what I remember is he said, these words. He says, but your face. And his real question was, why did my face look at him the way that it did? His voice trailed off there, and I started to, a lot came to mind in that moment. I realized that he had seen this look from me before. He had seen this look, it was a look of disappointment, of incredulity, like, how could you be doing this? And it was mixed with also this like self-absorbed, self-absorbed hot embarrassment of my own. And he'd seen this from me many times as a student leader, but I think this was the first time it was directed at him. And to be honest, I knew every time that that came out of me. Uh, every time, though, I justified its use. We had to get somewhere. Someone needed to do something better. Of course we need to move on. Of course we need to be more whatever in this moment. <laughs> After all, kids need to be prompted to pursue excellence, right? Right? Yeah. It was a gift that this friend of mine asked about the thing that I wanted to defend. Asked about the thing that I wished we could just pat move on from, that we didn't really need to take time to talk about. Because what bubbled up to the surface that night was something that I had experienced quite often. It just didn't get talked about a lot. My desire for things to run smoothly often superseded my desire to practice patience. 
And so, (laughs) the Lord started doing some work in me. Now, this isn't a story about patience only. This is a story about how I existed in my life, in my space, with my hands, with my ears, with my eyes, even with my nose. And this is a story about how Jesus would change me. At the time, I thought I was just learning about patience. But here we are a decade later, and I can see that in that moment, God began teaching me a new pattern altogether. And this is the pattern I'd like to share with you today. First, we're going to go to the scriptures. We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 is a beautiful letter. Um, It's actually the last letter from the first pastor. Peter was the first pastor of any group of believers in Uh, in the world after Jesus left, and this is the letter he writes not long before his death. So he writes with a lot of compassion and love and gentleness and tenderness. We're going to look in 2 Peter chapter 1 at verses 2 through 11. He says this, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. You are the believers receiving the letter both then and now. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire." So because of this, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, your virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that they are blind, having forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's as if Peter wants to say, you know Jesus, but you don't know quite what he wants to do in you yet. What's the point of this passage? The point of this passage is that believers in Jesus find themselves 100% in the grace and peace of Jesus. The day you believe in Jesus is the day that you enter the full grace and the full peace of Jesus. And he starts off at the beginning saying that Jesus' divine power has everything you need. And this is a really important concept to grasp before we start talking about the ways we are changed is to understand that it's Jesus who changes us and Jesus doesn't come to us in in modules. He's not a monthly subscription service that has sometimes updates. He is everything all at once, but that's a lot to take on. This passage reminds us that a relationship to Jesus is truly definitive. It's truly an identity. It's more than just an affiliation or an association. Knowing Jesus is being with the very Son of God. And this passage also reminds us that whatever God expects of us, from us, he provides to us through Jesus. And this is, this is perhaps the best news of the whole thing, that even while it will say, hey, you have faith, you need to add goodness and, and these other qualities, he never starts saying, you need to do this. He's saying, Jesus has the whole storehouse, you just got to start on unpacking some of these boxes where you live. Whatever God expects of you, he provides for you through Jesus. This is the foundation of spiritual formation. Everything you need to grow as a person is in him. When you or I believe in Jesus, we have 100% access to all that he is. And that's so encouraging today. I wonder, have you ever seen a picture of the mountains? Have you? You ever seen a, the beautiful picture of all the ranges and things? 
I'm going to set this to the side, y'all. I'm short enough, and it's slowly sinking. So I don't want to end up behind the table. Have you ever seen a picture of the mountains? They're beautiful, they're inspiring, but I wonder if you've had the opportunity to travel to the mountains and to stand in a spot where the mountains are surrounding you, where the mountains and their bigness and the expanse of them and the the firmness and the unchanging nature of them overwhelms you. And I wonder if we could think about mountains and the difference between a picture or actually being in them, if we could also ask ourselves, which is my experience of faith in Jesus like? Do I have a picture of Jesus that I find encouraging and inspiring? Or have I actually entered into a way of living where Jesus is changing me? Where the bigness and the unchanging nature of Jesus and his goodness is the environment that I find myself actually existing in. Which experience is your faith in Jesus more like? I think this question, is in, this question is important because I think this passage would have us know Jesus will change the way you experience your life. He will change your life. This passage again says that because you have 100% of Jesus available to you, you also have a responsibility to experience Jesus in 100% of your life. You have 100% of Jesus at your disposal, so you have a bit of a responsibility to experience Jesus in 100% of your life. And this could be a lot easier to understand if we simply said, hey, you've got two hours with your favorite celebrity. Give them all your attention. You'd be like, of course, that's easy. I know what I want to ask about. Maybe it's an athlete. I want to ask about that one moment, you know. I want to ask Albert Pujols when he hit the home run off of Brad Lidge how good that felt. That was the, I'm sorry if you're an Astros fan to bring that up this morning. I don't mean to cause you harm. If you're a, a fan of a, an actor or an actress and you wanted to talk to Tom Hanks about all his movies and you had two hours, you know that you could focus in, right? You know that for two hours there would be nothing but time and attention and water And whatever else is at that table as you spend this time together. But what's it like to have 100% access to the Son of God, 100% of your time, and we struggle, don't we, to really engage his presence, to really engage his greatness? These are the lessons of spiritual formation. Not that we're bad, but that there's more for us. And so the scripture comes to us and says, make every effort to grow in your faith. What would it mean to experience 100% of Jesus and 100% of life? The list here talks about, well, virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love. One way to approach this passage is to do definitions for each of those and ask, well, what are these things? But I would kind of like us to set aside the definitions. I think most of these terms, most of us understand. And I want to ask this. What do each of these require of us? What does faith that gets added, that gets virtue added to? What does virtue require of me? What does knowledge, what does growing in knowledge mean that I need to spend my time doing? What is the distance between who I am today and what the self-control listed here suggests? And we could go on. Godliness, brotherly affection, love. What do each of these require of us? That is the distance between spiritual formation and your reality is what these things would cost you for them to become more true of you because of your faith in Christ. Is this a list about active morals? Or is this a list about change? I would suggest this is a gut-level list about change. This is a gut-level question of spiritual formation. And our question, can you and I actually be transformed? Can we actually be changed by Jesus? I think so. I really do. 
But I think that our change, and this is the lesson that I hope to share, our change is much more mundane than we might understand. There's a pastor uh, in, in the south part of the city. Actually, I think Paul and Brenda are visiting today. Zach Eswine. He wrote a book that gave me such help. And he suggests that Jesus can so fundamentally change our experience of life that we wind up sensing the world differently. And what he means by senses is the way that we see, the way that we hear, the way that we touch, the way that we taste, even the way that we smell changes as Jesus transforms us. And this is why I think sometimes change eludes us because we imagine it's much more complex, that it's much more about something that happens way up here in our head and much less about something that happens in our everyday life. But again, what I'd like to suggest is spiritual formation is much more mundane than we might understand. Let's talk briefly then about our need for change. Why is it we might need to learn a lesson about spiritual formation? I think, I think it's kind of on the sur- it's kind of right there. It's kind of something we know, but we don't talk about it too often. We are as a culture actually growing to talk about it more, both just in society at large and also in our church. And that, that's this is good. We need to change because we have been mentored, you have been mentored, I have been mentored into ways of living long before we knew Jesus or could think critically about our actions. You have habits that bubble up to the surface, words that come out of your mouth, tension that, that, that is created in your chest, You have fear and self-doubt that you did not create for yourself. You were mentored into by somebody else at some other time as it was their responsibility to raise you. And that's, while it's not your fault, it is your responsibility. Who you are is your responsibility. And Jesus loves who you are. And he comes to help you with those things that the broken people who also needed him, who love you very much, hadn't learned the lessons of yet to help you with when you were so young. You and I have been mentored into ways of living that Jesus wishes to re-mentor us. We are also so limited in our knowing, our ability to fix things, and even our presence. Y'all, it's such a gift from God, but it's such a frustration as a human who has so many things going on in our minds that you can only be in your seat right here, right now. You can't be at home attending to the thing that's that's needed. You can't also be with the family member that you know you need to get in contact with or the friend you'd like to hang out with. You can only be right here, right now. And this is how God has made us. Why do we need to change? We need to change because we're so very limited. We need to put our energy into the things that are of God first. And then lastly, we need to change because we have self-justifying excuses Most of us aren't trying to run thin on grace and peace. We just do. (laughs) The, the The verse two said, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Most of us experience a division of grace and peace in our life. And it's not because we're trying to experience less of it. It's just because it kind of happens. We live among justifiable excuses. By that I mean your loved ones, your neighbors, your coworkers, even your friends, if we're looking for a self-justifying excuse for why we don't quite exist with virtue or with brotherly affection, you can make up a lot of excuses and find quite a few. But (laughs) I don't think Jesus, I don't think Jesus wants to undignify us by just taking our excuses at face value. I think he wants to dignify us by by asking about our real experience and offering us real change. And then lastly, why is change so hard? Is because it's hard to face our shortcomings until we see the pain that they cause in others. This was the gift of my experience with my young friend. It was hard to really wrestle with what my impatience was doing until I saw it on somebody's face. And this is where Peter's words help us. Because Jesus wants to change our lives. 
our very experience of our lives, we must embrace spiritual formation. All of the reasons that we struggle with being changed aside, listen to what the text says. Make every effort. I think we understand that. In the New American Standard Bible, it says, applying all diligence. In the message, I love the way the message says this. It says, don't lose a minute as you allow your faith to grow and to grow and to grow. What's underneath this, as we begin to understand that we participate in the very life of Christ, first, we, have, we can admit readily, I've not become the final product yet. I'm just not there yet. And that's a good thing. That's an okay thing. This is the point. And then second, there's more to Jesus than I understand. So our baseline posture is, Lord, teach me. And you and I will learn as we hear from Jesus, observe Jesus, trust Jesus. We read our scriptures to find him. We pray to spend time with him. Because at the core of everything written in the New Testament, y'all, is this fundamental suggestion that because of who Jesus is, you or I can be in relationship with him, and that can be transformative. Not just relationship to him. The whole world has a relationship to Jesus. He is the sovereign Lord of all. That's why scripture says at the end of all things, every knee will eventually bow to Jesus. Everyone's accountable to him. But you and I who believe in him, we have relationship with him. And because you have relationship with him, you have 100% access to everything he is and everything he is wants to get involved in who you are. And because Jesus wants to change our lives, we must remember and embrace the goals of grace and peace. It's not more complicated than that. That is what changed me in the end. I finally faced the reality that the impatience in me was undermining the grace and peace that are mine. And the grace and peace that are for those who are in my life through me This impatience was undermining that, and it was time just for me to grow in Jesus, because it wasn't just my friend at church. It wasn't just students in the ministry. It was my young kids. It was my wife. It was my parents. It was everybody. Everybody knew what it was to see Dan as an impatient person. So for impatience, Jesus took me on this journey that grace and peace might do their work. He slowed me down so that I could observe the damage that it was, impatience was causing my own soul and was causing those around me. I sat with my own story long enough to see that Jesus didn't want me to ignore this anymore. He didn't want me to brush it aside because I had more important things to do, because somebody needed me. He just wanted me to really tell the truth about myself. Jesus wanted to change me. And so I looked at Scripture. I mean, it's his word, right? And it helps us. I looked at all the places that patience pops up in the Bible. And I saw that there's kind of two main categories for patience in the Bible. One concept of patience is waiting on the Lord. And the other concept of patience is about enduring through difficulty and trial. And the two go together. And as I began to understand... That patience was something, not that I had to fix for myself, but that Jesus had already shown a pattern in his word. He is, he knows patience inside and out. He just wanted to bring into my heart what's already in his. And it's not that much of my life changed, it's that how I lived much of my life started to change. Jesus opened my eyes to the fact that he had a pattern of dealing with interruptions, delays, and disappointments. And he just wanted to teach me that. So then I reflected on what impatience really was in my life. It was an anxious rushing. It was this anxious hurry that had become a habit of my existence. Ironically, sometimes that would show up as procrastination and at other times as fussing. But impatience was run in the streets. And this journey through awareness into the inspiration of Scripture, into reflection where Jesus is really talking to me about what it's going to look like to change and eventually beginning to change myself was this beautiful walk with the Lord. It was a beautiful hike through the mountains that are spiritual formation with Jesus. And so Jesus has been, for the past 11 years, 
transforming me into a more patient man. And I'm glad for that. I got a long way to go, but I'm very glad for that. So recognizing this pattern of spiritual formation, this awareness and inspiration, reflection and change has helped me. And anytime I get to encourage somebody else, it helps others to stop trying to do Jesus' work for him. The point of 2 Peter chapter 1 is not to tell you, hey, believer, you're not doing enough. It's saying, hey, believer, if you could only slow down, spend some time with the Lord, let him do some stuff, you won't believe where he will take you. I, uh, I've become more aware of the fact that grace and peace have come not to paint the walls of my existence, but to resurrect the entire place. Jesus wants you to experience grace and peace through your hands, through your words, through your ears and seeing and being. The goals of grace and peace are coming home to our realities, inviting Jesus to do his best work. This is spiritual formation. Think of the movies Inside Out, one and two. It shows the interior world of this character, Riley, and if you're familiar with it, you know, there's these emotions that have this control board And as Riley grows, there's more emotions and things get a little more complex. I think sometimes as Christians, we hear about spiritual formation and we think we just need Jesus to come run the board. He can do that. But as I've come to understand the Lord and understand what his spirit does in us, Jesus actually thinks of you with so much dignity and in such high regard. He doesn't want to take over the board for you. He wants to come in and redeem every part of your experience. He wants to put his hand on anger and teach anger, your anger, a better way. He wants to put his arm around fear, your fear, and love you. He wants to pull up your memories and he wants to walk through your story so that you might as it says in verse 4, so that you might partake of the divine nature that you might be with Jesus and experience everything that he is in everything that you are. And in this way, your calling and election becomes very sure. What he says at the end of this passage is pretty practical. When you're walking with Jesus and you know that he's changing you, you know the hope that you're headed toward. There's so much to gain by walking with the Lord and allowing him to change us. So what are the next steps? What could we do from here? What could I encourage you to do with this concept of spiritual formation? First, I would say this. If you are a knower of Jesus but not a believer in Jesus, I would encourage you to start and enter a relationship with Jesus. Because, again, the whole world has to relate to him. But you have the opportunity, because you're hearing about the goodness and the grace of God in Jesus, to be in relationship with him. This is only as complex as it needs to be for you. You could start believing where you sit. You can bow your head and pray. You can seek somebody out to talk about it. But in in any case, whatever the avenue, whatever the venue, I'd encourage you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, that needs to start today. Because Jesus is full of grace and peace that he would love to move in to who you are. Second, I would encourage anyone who is a believer in Jesus to recalibrate your practice of time with Jesus. And I don't really have a specific guideline other than to say, can we take the idea that Jesus wants to change us significantly, can we take that seriously? And then can we ask the question, is there a habit in my life of spending time with Jesus? There's something that Pastor Austin says that I've already grabbed onto that I love He says we want to be with Jesus so that we can become like Jesus. So one of the direct applications of this idea of spiritual formation is simply to recalibrate your practice of being with Jesus. Third, can I encourage us to recalibrate our expectations of Jesus? I think sometimes, again, I just think we get caught up and we think he wants to make me a better Christian. Not really. He wants to teach you how to see in a more peaceful and gracious way. He wants to teach you how to hear 
differently. He wants to te- teach you how to touch so that your touch communicates grace and peace to others. He wants to walk with you that the way that you taste, the way that you engage in the world helps you be more faithful to how God created you and less of a consumer that this world tries to force you into. The Lord even wants to help you smell differently. I don't mean how you smell. I mean what this does. Some of the most beautiful people on the planet on the inside smell the worst on the outside. And Jesus wants to teach you to get close enough to smell them and to love them like he does. Jesus wants to teach you how to experience grace and peace through your practical experience of life. And then lastly, I would suggest we probably need to recalibrate our defenses with people, especially when we see that the way we're acting has caused them pain. If you are a believer in Jesus, that is a sacred moment where Jesus would love, 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 love to come heal that thing. Because I promise you, he does not want you to keep experiencing such a lack of grace and peace in your life. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much that you and your goodness have come that we might experience you in all of our humanness. You, Jesus, are up to something up to something unique in this world. You are making a people for your very own. And you want to make us into something, into someone that experiences your your grace and your peace, that you, you hard won. Lord, you put everything on the line when you died on the cross. When you when you went into the grave and when you rose again, you put so much on the line that our faith in you might be transformative. And so we honor you. And we look to you. And Lord, I ask for my friends because I'm going to assume that they, like me, have lots of growing to do. That they they don't want to, to cause hurt in others. They don't want to keep experiencing the same patterns that they've grown up with. They would really like Jesus to grow in the way that 1 Peter shares. To grow into virtue and knowledge and self control and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. Jesus, you would do these things in us. Help us to become aware of what's going on in our lives. Help us to find inspiration from your very presence and from your very words. Help us to reflect on the true story that we've been living. And Jesus, at the end of the day, would you change us that we might have grace and peace multiplied in our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. Friends, let's